We have started our last chapter, Software Evolution. In this chapter, we have already talked about the evolution processes. We have said that, yeah, um, we have talked about the, the evolution process Propose, uh, yeah, the software evolution process. It includes uh, some fundamental activities of change analysis, release planning, system implementation, and release a system to customers. And we have also talked about the change implementation and the emergency repair process. Okay. No one replies. No, I have no interaction. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Rana and Shibli. Uh, yes. Before continuing, continuing with uh, new things, we'll at first we'll pass our small question. Sorry, we'll pass uh, a small revision question. I have talked about it just then, but perhaps some of you haven't uh, paid attention. So, the um, the could you list the fundamental Activities, activities, activities included in the software evolution process. Could you list it? Could you list the fundamental activities included in the software evolution processes? Process. You are so quiet. Please repeat the question. My need to cut. I didn't hear the question. Um, Kaya, please. Um, yeah, for everyone, the question. <laughs> List the mm -hmm. fundamental activities included in the software evolution process. Like initial development, evolution, servicing, phase out. Are you, are you talking about these things? uh not exactly shibli uh it's rather for software evolution process normally we talk about change like change of proce uh, process for software systems something like that like program evolution dynamics unresting understanding software evolution making changes to operational software system mm. It's not what we have. Like impact. Yeah. Analyzing. Asma has. <laughs> okay, Asma and Iqbal. Impact yeah. analysis, release planning. Okay. Change request, impact analysis, release planning, change implementation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and got it. Yeah, it's, it's a. Uh, yeah. It's very, it's a, uh, it's a very detailed answer. Thank you, Asma. Yeah, and these three, those last three, they are included in release planning. Yeah, port repair, platform adaptation, and system enhancements. They are included in release planning. So if you want, you can don't list these three. You can just say uh, release planning. But yeah, it's um it's very good. Thank you, Asma. Here we have the fundamental activities of um, and we had we had a an assignment about the change implementation and the emergency repair process. So we will not talk about it here because it's it, it normally it should be in your assignment. So we are continue. 
uh, we'll continue with our program Evolution Dynamics, which is the second section of this part. Program Evolution Dynamics. It is the study of the processes of system change. As we say here, software evolution concerns always changing. And after several major empirical studies, Lama and Benedict proposed that there were a number of laws that applied to all systems as they evolved. Uh, here is the history of program evolution dynamics, which um, in the 1970s and 1980s, these two people, Lama and Benedict, they have carried out many empirical studies of system change with a view to understanding more about characteristics of software evolution. And the work continued in the 1990s as these, yeah, as Lama and others investigated the, the significance of feedback in evolution processes. And from these studies, they have proposed some laws we can call them Lohmann laws, named with his name, concerning system change. And here, there are sensible observations rather than laws. They are applicable to large systems developed by large organizations. It is not clear if they are applicable to other types of software system. Um, Lama and Bellady, they claimed that these laws are likely to be true for all types of large organizational software systems. And these are systems, yeah, these are systems in which the requirements are changing to reflect the changing business needs. And new release of the system are essential for the system to provide business value that means the environment the business environment change then we need to change our program our system to keep keep it useful the system requirements are likely to change while well, the system is being developed because the environment is changing therefore a delivered system won't meet its requirements yeah, you see, the, um, the change of the environment may change the requirements, and then uh, we may modify or evolve the system. And systems are tightly coupled with their environment. When our system is installed in our environment, it changes that environment and therefore changes the system requirements. You see here, they have an interaction uh, system between the system and the environment. The system can change the environment and then the, the, in the change of the environment may change also the system requirements. And systems must be changed if they are to remain useful in our environment. So we need the software evolution to keep it useful. Here is the Lehman's laws, as we have said in the introduction. Here, the first law is the conservation of familiarity, famili familiar, familiarity. Over the lifetime of our system, the incremental change in each release is approximately constant. You see, this first law states that system maintenance is an inevitable process. As the system's environment changes, new requirements emerge and the system must be modified. And when the modified system is reintroduced to the environment, 
This promotes more environmental chain changes. So the evolution process starts again. You see, that's why we say the incremental change in each release is approximately constant. For the second law, it's, it is the continuing growth. The functionality offered by systems has to continually increase to maintain user satisfaction. This law states that as a system is changed, its structure is degraded. The only way to avoid this happening is to invest in preventive, preventative maintenance. And we spend time improving the software structure without adding to its functionality. Obviously, this means additional cores over and above those of implementing required system changes. So here we have the continuing growth. No, what's wrong? We have the increasing complexity. Oh, it was a mistake, but yeah, here at our involving program changes, its structure tends to become more and more complex. So extra resources must be devoted to preserving and simplifying the structure. The first law is continuing change a program that is used in a real world environment must necessarily change or else become progressively less useful in that environment so we have the continuing changing and increasing complexity for the moment and the third law is the large program evolution program evolution is a self-regulating process System attributes such as size, time between releases, and the number of reported errors is approx approximately invariable, invariant for each system release. This third law is perhaps the most interesting and the most contentious of all these laws. It suggests that large systems have a dynamic of their own that is established at an early stage in the development process. And this determines the growth change of the system maintenance process and limits the number of possible system changes. Lama and his friend already they suggest that this law is a consequence of structural factors that influence and constrain system change and organizational factors that affect the evolution process. Um, yeah, here for large program evolution, the structural factors that affect this law come from the complexity of large systems. As when we change and extend our program, its structure tends to degrade, as we have said for the second law. And this is true for all types of system, not just the software, but also uh, hardware or something else. And it occurs because we are adapting our structure intended for one purpose, for a different purpose. This degradation, if unchecked, makes it more and more difficult to make further changes to the program. And making small changes reduces the extent of structural degradation and so lessens the risks of causing serious system dependability problems. If we try and make large changes, there is a high probability that these will introduce new faults. These then inhibit further program changes. So you see the organizational factors that affect this 
third law, large program evolution. They reflect the fact that large systems are usually produced by large organizations. And these companies have internal bureaucracies that set the change budget for each system and control the decision-making process. And companies that have to make decisions on the risks and the value of the changes and the costs involved. These kind of decisions take time to make and sometimes it takes longer to decide on the changes to be made than change implementation as it is a large evol uh, evolution. So the speed of the, the organization's decision-making processes covers the rate of change of the system. And then we have the fourth law, which is organizational sta uh, stability. Over a program's lifetime, its rate of development is approximately constant and independent of the, of the resource devoted to system development. This fourth rule, it suggests that most large programming, pro uh, programming projects work in a saturated state. That is, a change to resources or staffing has imperceptible effects on the long-term evolution of the system. And this is consistent with the third, with the, this large program evolution law, because it suggests that program evolution is largely independent of management decisions. And this organizational stability, this law, it confirms that large software development teams are often unproductive because communication overheads dominate the work of the team. And we have the fifth law, which is the conservation of familiarity. It is over the time, lifetime of our system, the incremental change in each release is approximately constant. This law, it is concerned with the change increments in each system release. So you see here, we add new functionality to our system. And it inevitably introduces new system faults. And the more functionality added in each release, the more faults there will be. So a large increment in functionality in one system release means that this will have to be followed by a further release in which the new system faults are repaired. And the relatively little new functionality should be included in this release. And this law suggests that we should not budget for large functionality increments in each release without taking into account the need for fault repair. You see these five first laws were in initial proposals. The remaining laws were added after further work. And then we have the sixth and seventh laws. They are similar. And essentially, they say that users of software will become increasingly unhappy with it unless it is maintained and new functionality is added to it. You see, the functionality offered by system has to continually increase to maintain user satisfaction. The quality of systems will decline unless they are modified to reflect changes in their operational environment. And the final law is the feedback system. Evolution processes incorporate multi-agent, multi-loop feedback systems, and you have to treat them as feedback systems to achieve significant 
product improvement. So you see the final law, the, the eighth one, it reflects the most recent work on feedback processes. Although it is not yet clear how this can be applied in practical software development. Um, yeah, here Lohmann's observation seems generally sensible. And they seem to be generally applicable to large tailored systems developed by large organizations. It is confirmed in early 2000 by work, or work by Lerman on the fifth object project. It is, uh, we have some questions for these laws. It is not clear how they should be modified for shrink wrapped software products. Um, yeah, how we can modify them for systems that incorporate a significant number of core components for small organizations and medium sized systems. Um, yeah, we should take into account these observations when planning the maintenance process. And it may be that business consideration require them to be ignored at any one time. For example, for marketing reasons, it may be necessarily to make several major system changes in a single release. And the likely consequences of this are that one or more releases devoted to error repair are likely to be required. We often see this in personal computer software where a, when a new, when a major new release of applic an application is quickly, it's often quickly followed by a bug repair update. Yeah, I think it's it's also like the the example that given by Roy and Saji. You talked about the yeah the mobile phone of Xiaomi. I think they have the same. They have a similar yeah, problem with their release, their bug repair updates, etc. Okay. Now we are passed to the software maintenance. Software maintenance. It is the general process of changing a system after it has been delivered, modifying the program after it has been in, put into use. The term is mostly used for changing custom software and generic software products are said to evolve to create new versions. This term is usually applied to custom software in which separate development groups are involved before and after delivery. Maintenance does not normally involve major changes to the system's architecture. The changes made to the software may be simple changes to correct coding errors, more extensive changes to correct design errors and significant enhancement to correct specification errors or accommodate new requirements. So changes are implemented by modifying existing components and adding new components to the system where necessary. Yeah. As we say, we have three different types of software maintenance. Yeah, this part is just like what is said by Adman for the release planning. Okay, uh, I'll show these three rapidly and you uh, you see here these three types of maintenance. Maintenance to repair software faults. We are changing our system to correct deficiency in the way meets its requirements. 
The second one is maintenance to adapt software to a different operating system environment. Changing a system so that it operates in a different environment, a computer or operation systems, etc., from its initial implementation, and maintenance to add to or modify the system's functionality, modifying the system to satisfy new requirements. Um, so here, could you? As here we have already the. Yeah, some explanations of these types of maintenance. And could you identify which one is the cheapest and which one is the most expensive? Well, I think the most expensive one is maintenance mm -hmm. to adapt operating environments. You talk about the second one, this one? Yeah, the second one. Kaya, then the um, cheapest. Yeah. I, I'm not sure which one's the cheapest. <laughs> so the most expensive you think it is this one, maintenance to adapt yes. to software. Okay. And uh, any other ideas? Thank you, Kaya. Do you remember I have said that these different types of maintenance, it relates or it concerns with the activities involved in release planning as said by Atman. Release planning, it includes these three activities. Fault repair, it's like the maintenance to repair software faults. Platform adaptation, maintenance to adapt software to a different operating environment and system enhancements, maintenance to add to or modify the system's functionality. Uh, and Kaya think that, thinks that this, the second one, platform adaptation is the most expensive. Um, do you have any other ideas or what is the cheapest type of maintenance? Okay, our, um, what can I do here? Yeah. Just for the first one, mm. oh, third maybe, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Roy. And for the first one, maintenance to repair software faults. Here, um, I our man, our list several kinds of faults, fault repairs, like um, coding. I will explain it later. Coding errors. Design errors and the requirements. Okay, requirements. Here for the first one, uh, maintenance to repair software faults, changing our system to correct the deficiencies in the way meets its requirements. We may have these three kind of, yeah, I have listed these three kinds of errors to be, or three kinds of deficiencies to be corrected, like coding errors, design errors, requirements errors. Can you list among these three errors? Which one is the cheapest and which one is the most expensive? Update number two is replacing number three. <laughs> okay, you have talked about the different types of maintenance. And now we will talk about the first one and we will analyze them one by one. You will see the reason. Coding errors, yeah. And which one is the most expensive?
number three. Um, you have other, uh, others have different opinions or not? For coding errors, design errors, and requirements errors. Yeah. And Kaya said, mm, um, agrees with Roy. <laughs> I think Adman agrees with him too. Okay, yeah. Um, in fact, it's like this. Because and um, Roy is correct at coding errors, they are usually relatively cheap to correct. It's just the code we, uh, with the programming language, we correct some errors, some small coding errors. And design errors are more expensive as they may involve re rewriting several program components. When we have some errors in the design, we may need to change the program components. So we need to rewrite them. It includes the coding. And for the requirements errors, they are the most expensive to repair because of the extensive system redesign, which may be necessary. That means if we have some requirements errors, we may have to change to, yeah, to redesign the system. So it involves, it, like, it is like, it involves design, uh, yeah, uh, the correction of design. So you see for the fault repairs, we have several different types. For example, coding errors is the most, ex is the cheapest and design errors, the most expensive among these errors may be the requirements errors. These are, um, yeah, these are for the fault repairs, the, the, in, the maintenance to repair software faults. And for the two others, you may also think about it like this. Now I will note for your attendance, And I have, yeah, I have noted for your attendance, we have two absences today. It's Ken and Kamru Zama. Yeah, Ken and Kamru Zama. Okay. If you have some doubts, don't hesitate to Tell me here. Yeah, we were here for the maintenance. We have talked about the first step, which is the fault repairs or maintenance to repair software faults. Here we have said that it included three, at least three types of three errors, the coding errors, which are usually relatively cheap to correct. Design errors are more expensive as they may involve they may involve rewriting several program components and the requirements errors, which are more, the most expensive to repair because of the extent the extensive system redesign which may be necessary. So, yeah, in this process or in this type of maintenance, we change the system to correct deficiencies in the way meet, to meet its requirements. And the second type is the maintenance to adapt software to a different operating environment. We may also call it environmental adaptation. We need to change the system so that it operates in a different oper different environment um, that means the computer or operating system from its initial implementation 
This type of maintenance is required when some aspects of the system's environment, as said here, um, the platform, the computer of the computer, the platform, yeah, like the hardware, the platform operating systems or other support software changes. When we have these changes of environment, or oh, um, yeah, the application system must be applied, must be modified to adapt to uh, to adapt it to cope with these environmental changes. So here is the environmental adaptation, and the third one, maintenance to add to or modify the system's functionality. It's the functionality addition. This type of maintenance is necessary when the system requirements change in response to organizational or business change. So we modify the system to satisfy these new requirements. The scale of the changes required to the software is over much larger or greater than for the other types of maintenance. So as said by Roy, this one, maintenance to repair software faults is the cheapest. And the third one, maintenance to add to mod modify the system's functionality is the most expensive. Uh, even the, yeah, as we say, the scale of the change required to this one is often much greater than these two other types of maintenance. And in practice, there is not a clear-cut distinction between these types of maintenance. When we adapt the system to a new environment, yeah, for the, this one, we may add functionality to take advantage of new environmental features. We may relate to this one. Software faults, this one, are often exposed because users use the system in unexpected ways. And changing the system to accommodate their way of working is the best way to fix these faults. So you see, all three types of maintenance, they are not clearly cut. And these types of maintenance are generally recognized, but different people sometimes give them different names. Um, yeah, as we have said, the maintenance to repair software faults, we may call it fault repairs. Some people may also call it corrective maintenance. As it refer also, it refers also to maintenance for fault repair. However, adaptive maintenance sometimes means adapting to a new environment and sometimes means adapting the software to new requirements. And perfect, uh, perfective maintenance sometimes means perfecting the software by implementing new requirements for this one. In other cases, it means maintaining the functionality of the system, but improving its structure and its performance. Yeah, so you see, even for the name of these types of maintenance, we may have many possibilities. Um, from this, we have some surveys, and we probably, you know, we generally agree that software maintenance key takes up a higher proportion of IT bargains than new developments. Rather, the, um, roughly two thirds maintenance and one third development. So you see that the importance of maintenance. Also, most of people agree that more of the maintenance budget is spent on implementing new requirements than on fixing bugs. Here we have a figure. This figure, it shows an approximate distribution of maintenance costs. 
the specific percentage will obviously vary from one organization to another, but universally repairing system faults, this one, it is not the most expensive maintenance activity. As shown here, it's only 17%. Evolving the system to cope with new environments and new or changed requirements consumes more maintenance efforts. Effort. You see this one, functionality addition or modification, it takes, takes up more than half of the cost. And the relative costs of maintenance and new development vary from one application domain to another. Um, yeah, it depends on the system. Sometimes that perhaps it will be less. The maintenance costs for business application systems are probably broadly comparable with system development costs. Yeah, and yeah, do you remember the embedded real-time systems? The embedded real-time systems. For the embedded real-time systems, maintenance may cost more. They may cost, they may cost uh, up to four times more than development costs. And the high reliability and performance requirements of these systems mean that modules have to be tightly linked and hence difficult to change. Yeah, although these estimates are more than 25 years old, it is unlikely that the cost distribution for different types of system have significantly changed. So it is usually cost effective to invest effort in designing and implementing a system to reduce the cost of future changes. When we add new functionality after delivery, it is very expensive because we have to spend time learning the system and analyzing the, the impact of the proposed changes. So work done during development to make the system easier to understand and change is likely to reduce evolution costs. And good software engineering techniques, such as precise specification, the use of object-oriented development and configuration management contribute to maintenance cost reduction. Here, Yeah, we say maintenance costs usually greater than development costs. We may have two times to one hundred times depending on the on the application, and they are affected by both technical and non technical factors. The costs increases as software is maintained. Maintenance corrupts the software structure, so makes further maintenance more difficult. Aging software can have high support costs, like we need to change the programming language, compilers, etc. And this figure shows how overall lifetime costs may decrease as more effort is expended during system development to produce a maintainable system. You see, for system one, we have yeah, um, nearly two, 25,000, yeah, it should be 25, yeah, here, as here, here. $25,000 extra development costs. They are, investigate, they are investi invested in making the system, developing 
courts. Um, so with uh, these two twenty five thousand dollars, we make the system more containable. And this one, this extra development courts results in a saving of you see here, here a saving of about one hundred miller, one hundred thousand dollars in maintenance courts. over the lifetime of the system. So you see, we have the potential reduction in course of understanding, analysis, and testing. There is a significant multiplier effect when the system is developed for maintainability. And this assumes that a percentage increase in development courts resulting a comparable percentage decrease in overall system courts. Uh, even though these estimates are hypothetical, but there is no doubt that de developing software to make it more maintainable is cost effective. When the whole life course of the software are taken into account, this is the rationale for reflect refactoring in agile development. Without refactoring, the code becomes more and more difficult and expensive to change. However, in planned based development, the reality is that Additional investment in code improvement is rarely made during development. And this is mostly due to the ways most soft organizations run their budgets. And investing in maintainability leads to short-term cost increase, which are measurable. Unfortunately, the long-term gains cannot be measured at the same time, so companies are reluctant to spend money for an unknown future return. So you see, it is usually more expensive to add functionality after the a system is in operation than it is to implement the same functionality during development. We have several reasons for this one. The first one is the team stability. Maintenance costs are reduced if the same staff are involved with them for some time. After a system has been delivered, it is normal for the development team to be broken up and for people to work on new projects. And the new team or the, the individuals responsible for system maintenance do not understand the system or the background to the to system design decisions. They need to spend time and spend more time understanding the existing system before implementing changes to it. So you see, um yeah, the earlier we need uh the earlier we change, we evolve the software, well, or we maintenance the software, the cheaper it will cost as the team is stable, it's more stable. The second reason is the poor, is the con contractual responsibility, we may also call it poor development practice. The developers of a system may have no contractual responsibility for maintenance, so there is no incentive to design for future change. The contract to maintain a system is usually separate from the system development contract. And the maintenance contract may be given to a different company rather than the original system developer. And this factor, along with the lack of team stab stability, means that there is no incentive for a develop development 
team to write maintainable, maintainable software. If our development team can cut corners to save effort during development, it is worthwhile for them to do so. Even if this means that the software is more difficult to change in the future. The third reason for this is the staff skills. Maintenance staff are more often inexperienced and have limited domain knowledge. Maintenance staff, they are often, yeah, unfamiliar with the, the application domain and maintenance has a poor image among software engineers. It seem it is yeah. Uh, sometimes we may think that maintenance is a less skilled process than system development, and we often allocate maintenance to the most junior staff. Furthermore, old systems may be written in absolute obsolete programming languages and the maintenance staff may not have much experience of development in this language and must learn this language to maintain the system. The last reason for it is the program age and structure. As programs age, their structure is degraded and they become harder to understand and change. As we said before, with the changes made to programs, their structure tends to degrade. And consequently, as a program age, age that they become harder to understand, said here, and difficult to change. And some systems have been developed without modern software engineering techniques. They may never have been well structured and were perhaps op optimized for efficiency rather than understandability. System documentation may be lost or inconsistent. And all the systems may not have been subject to stringent configuration management, so time is often wasted finding the right versions of system components to change. You see, the first three of these problems stem from the fact that many organizations still consider development and maintenance to be separate activities. Maintenance is seen as a second class, labor, uh, second class activity and there is no incentive to spend money during development to reduce the cost of system change. And the only long-term solution to this problem is to accept that systems really have a defined lifetime but continue in use in some form for an indefinite period. As we have in suggested in the, the, in the introduction, we should think of systems as evolving so throughout their lifetime through a continual development process. And this fourth issue, the problem of degraded system structure, it is the easiest problem to adjust. And software reengineering techniques, as described later in this chapter, they may be applied to improve the system structure and understandability. Architectural transformations can adapt the system to new hardware. And refactoring can improve the quality of the system code and make it easier to change. This is for the software maintenance. And we'll see the maintenance prediction. Many maintenance prediction is concerned with assessing which part of the system may cause problems and have high maintenance costs. Managers hate surprises. 
especially if these result in unexpectedly high costs. So we should try to predict what system changes might be proposed and what parts of the system are likely to be the most difficult to maintain. We should also try to estimate the overall maintenance course for a system in a given time period. Uh, for the maintenance prediction, it is concerned with assessing which part of the system may cause problems and have high maintenance costs. We have the change acceptance, which, is, which depends on the maintainability of the components affected by the change. Implementing changes degrades the system and reduces its maintainability. Maintenance costs depend on the number of changes and the cost of change depend on maintainability. This figure shows these predictions and associated questions. You see we have the predicting maintainability, what part of the system will be the most expensive to maintain, predicting maintenance costs, what will be the lifetime maintenance course of this system? What will be the course of maintaining this system over the next year? And predicting system changes. How many change requests can be expected? What part of the system are most likely to be affected by change requests? So you see, predicting the number of change requests for a system requires an understanding of the relationships between the system and its external environment. As said here, predicting the number of changes requires an understanding of the relationships between a system and its environment. Tightly coupled systems require changes whenever the, the environment is changed. Some systems have a very complex relationship between, with their external environment and changes to that environment inevitably result in changes to the system. And yeah, to evaluate the relationships between our system and its environment, we should adjust some factors influencing the relationships. The first one is the number and the complexity of system interfaces. Here, the larger the number of interfaces and the more complex these interfaces, the more likely it is that interface changes will be required as new requirements are proposed. The second one is the number of inherent, inherent, inherently volatile system requirements. As we've discussed before, in the fourth chapter, requirements that reflect organizational policies and procedures, they are likely to be more volatile than requirements that are based on stable domain characteristics. So the number of inherently volatile system requirements can influence the relationships strongly. And the third factor is the business processes where the system is used. As business processes evolve, they generate system change requests. And the more business processes that use our system, the more the demands for system change. Yeah, so we see that Predictions of maintainability can be made by assessing the complexity of system components. For many years, 
researchers have looked at look at looked at the relationships between program complexity as measured by matrix here, such as sacromatic complexity and maintainability. It is not surprising that these studies have found that the more complex a system of component, the more expensive it is to maintain. And complexity measure, uh, measurements are part particularly useful in identifying program components that are likely to be expensive to maintain. Studies have shown that most maintenance effort is spent on a relatively small number of system components. Oh, yeah, we have some researchers who examined a number of system components and found that this one, found this point, maintenance effort intend, uh, tended to be focused on a small number of complex components. And to reduce maintenance costs, we need to replace complex system components with the simpler alternatives. And complexity depends on three things. Complexity of control structures, complexity of data structures, object method, procedure, and module size. After a system has been put into its device, we may be able to use process data to help predict maintainability. Examples of process metrics that can be used for assessing maintainability are these four. Yeah, we have four examples. The first one is the number of requests for corrective maintenance. The process matrix may be used to assess, a pen. yeah. Um, for this example, an increase, or, uh, an increase in the number of requests a bug and failure reports may indicate that more errors are being introduced into the program that are being repaired during the maintenance process. And this may indicate a decline in maintainability. And the second example is the average time required for impact analysis. This reflects the number of program components that are affected by the change request. If this time increases, it implies more and more components are affected and the maintainability is decreasing. The third one is the average time taken to implement a change request. A change request. This is not the same as the time for impact Analysis, although it may correlate correlate with it, this is the amount of time that we need to modify the system and its documentation. After we have assessed which components are affected, an increase in the time needed to implement a change may indicate a decline in maintainability. And the fourth example is the number of outstanding change requests. An increase in this number over time may imply a decline in maintainability. So you see here, if any or all of these is increasing, this may indicate a decline in maintainability. And we use predicted information about change requests and predictions about system maintainability to predict maintenance costs. And most managers combine this information with intuition and experience to estimate costs. 
Now we will see the software re-engineering. As we have discussed in the previous sections, the process of system evolution involves understanding the program that has uh, that has to be changed and then implementing these changes. However, many systems, especially all the legacy systems, are difficult to understand and change. The programs may have been optimized for performance or space utilization at the, the expense of understandability, or over time, the initial program structure may have been corrupted by a series of changes. You see, restructuring or rewriting part of part part a part or all of a legacy system without changing its functionality. And system re-engineering is applicable where some or but not all subsystems of a larger system require frequent maintenance. And to make legacy software systems easier to maintain, we can re-engineer these systems to improve their structure and understandability. Re-engineering involves adding effort to make them easier to maintain. The system may be restructured and redocumented. Yeah, we may involve some activities like redocumenting the system, refactoring the system architecture, translating C programs to a modern programming language and modifying and updating the structure and the values of the system's data. And the functionality of the software is not changed and normally we should try to avoid making major changes to the system architecture. We have two, advan two important benefits or advantages from re-engineering rather than replacement. The first one is the reduced risk. There is a high risk in new software business critical software. Yeah, especially when we redevelop it. And there may be development problems, staffing problems and specification problems. Yeah, we may make errors in the system specification or there may be development problems. And delays in introducing the new software may mean that business is lost and extra costs are incurred. So this is the first advantage or benefit of re-engineering. The second one is the reduced cost. The cost of re-engineering is often significantly less than the cost of the cost of developing new software. In fact, with modern software technology, technology, the relative cost of re implementation is probably less than this, but will still considerably exceed the cost of re-engineering. You see here, this figure, it is a general model of the, the engineering re-engineering process. The input to the process is a legacy or a original program, and the output is an improved and restructured version of the same program. Here, we have different activities in this re-engineering process. You see, um, Okay. Um, 
For you, how many activities can we can we find in this general model of the the engineering process? Now, she please repeat the question. Yeah, please list um, the the activities found in this general model of the, the the engineering process yeah i have chapped it here uh, how can i i can make this more like this so you can find it um, more easily yeah please list the activities found in this general model of re-engineering process Reverse engineering, yeah, and others, other activities. Source code translation. Yeah, very good. Then um, pro program modulation. Um, program modular modularization. Modulation. Uh, modularization yeah <laughs> yeah okay yeah and data engineering oh then yeah. program structure structure improvements as well exactly well. you have found the five activities included in this process as shown by this how to say the four mm, rectangle rounded rectangle perhaps yeah, these we have these five activities involved in the engineering process, and it you see the other rectangles like this. They are included, or the documentation they are included in these in these activities. Yes, yeah, Saddam and Kaya, thank you very much for your answer for these activities. Yeah, we will explain these five activities in detail next class. Uh, yeah, we don't have assignment today. I think that what we have had yesterday, no, uh, before yesterday, Monday, normally it should be the last assignment. So please, Finish it as soon as possible and send it to Roy. We may have some, yeah. Uh, normally, next week we are begin our revision. We'll start by the um, the comments of the assignment. I think. Okay. Um, these are all for today. Um. Thank you very much for your attention. And we are say, see you tomorrow. Yeah, I have sent, I think the PDF, I have sent it already in a group. Mm, I have seen Kamruzama sometimes, but I'm not sure he if he's always there. Kamruzama. Perhaps I'll give him half attendance.